News of the Times, Wicked Wednesdays, Murder and the Unwritten Law. Welcome to News of the Times. Our regular listeners will be familiar with what can be regarded as the harshness of English law, as historically even minor infractions could lead to execution. In the post-World War I environment, we found two interesting cases of acquittal based on the unwritten law. This argues the case for justifiable vengeance due to an insult to the family. Our first case from France, of course, was a sensation in its day, as Madame Perron, a famous singer and actress, shoots her philandering husband, who was the director of the Bordeaux Theatre. Love, passion, vengeance, a true French crime story. Our second story on English shores was equally sensational in its day. It is 1926, Canterbury. Two wealthy old Etonians are in a three-way love triangle filled with threats and passion until one of them is dead. But was this justifiable based on the unwritten law? This case featured the very famous counsel Sir Edward Marshall Hall in one of his last cases. Murder, family honour and the question of justifiable homicide is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. Madame Perron. It is 1922 in Bordeaux, France, and Gabrielle Perron, a well-known actress and singer, is being cheated on by her husband, Louis Perron, the director of the Grand Theatre in Bordeaux. This story crossed the pond, so to speak, sparking interest with the English public, where such displays of violent passion are usually not so public. We start with this news article from an English news correspondent at the trial. From the Illustrated Police News, the 9th of March, 1922. Actress, wife's terrible ordeal. Tragedy of love, passion and jealousy. Never was a tale of romantic jealousy caused by a husband's infidelity more dramatically told than in a Bordeaux assize court by pretty, black-haired Madame Perron, a well-known as a singer and an actress on the Paris stage, who recently shot her husband, the director of a Bordeaux theatre. An impressionable jury gave her the benefit of the unwritten law and acquitted her. Madame Perron made a love match with her husband just before the war. I love him so, was her most frequent interruption as she sat with a long black widow's veil in the dock. We were so happy with our two children, she said, giving evidence, but one day my husband paid a fatal visit with his company to Dijon. There he met Mademoiselle Guy, daughter of the director of that theatre, and fell in love with her. She used to come to our lodgings and play with my children, wept the accused woman, and I never dreamt she was already my husband's mistress. When, however, we returned to our home in Bordeaux, I learned that Mademoiselle Guy had followed us and that my husband had found her an apartment just opposite our house. She gave birth to a little boy. After a few months of this life I felt I could not stand it, and I decided to visit Mademoiselle Guy and ask her to go away and not to ruin the happiness of my home. That woman and Madame Perron pointed to the figure of Mademoiselle Guy, who was sitting, also clad in a widow's veils, in the well of the court, had the effrontery when my husband came into the room, there in front of my face, to go up to him and throw her 
arms around him to kiss him. I was mad, and I hit her. I hit her again, twice, when I saw her walking out with my husband in the streets. Finally finding that all my protests and even the scandal I made by these repeated scenes in vain, I made one last appeal to the husband I loved. He stood at the door of my house that fatal Sunday morning. He had just come back from church with his mistress. He told me he was going to leave me forever. He called on both my children to accompany him. He was infatuated by that woman, and again Madame Perron stood up and sweeping her black veil aside, pointing an accusing finger at Mademoiselle Guy, who was now crouching and weeping. Continuing, she said, my children cried and begged him to stay, saying they would not leave their mother. He pushed them aside and started to walk away. I felt in my vanity bag and pulled out a little pistol I always carried loaded. I pressed the trigger and fired three times, and my husband fell dead. There was a long pause after witness said this. Did you mean to kill or to wound or frighten him, suggested her counsel. With almost a shriek of passion, Madame Perron replied, I could not see him love another woman. I ought to have shot her, but the pistol was in my hand and I fired. That is all I have to say. The English were dumbfounded that she could have been acquitted completely through the use of the unwritten law. It was just deemed astonishing. From the Nottingham Evening Post, the 6th of March, 1922, The Unwritten Law. The unwritten law has again been invoked at Bordeaux. Madame Perron, an actress and the widow of the former director of the Grand Theatre there, has been unanimously acquitted on a charge of having murdered her husband in a fit of jealous rage. The facts of the case were not in dispute. A lady, whose acquaintance Monsieur Perron had made during the war, she nursed him when he was ill and became his mistress, and after qualifying as a dentist, was provided by him with a flat in Bordeaux, quite close to the house in which he lived with his wife. Last November, Madame Perron, after threatening and striking her husband's mistress with a revolver, met him during one of his infrequent visits to her home and shot him dead. Her trial resolved itself less into a judicial examination of the facts than into a discussion of the characters of the two women and the murdered men. Some witnesses declared that Madame Perron cared less for her husband and children than for her stage success. Witnesses for Madame Perron, the chief amongst them, was Mademoiselle Marcel Demargo, a well-known opera star and sister of the accused, bore testimony to Madame Perron's great devotion to her children and love for her husband. In spite of an appeal by counsel for the prosecution, who himself advocated leniency, the jury chose not to follow the example three previous Bordeaux juries by giving a verdict of acquittal in the full face of the facts. Madame Perron was found not guilty after a moving plea from her defender, who asked for her release because she was a good mother. Four years later, a love triangle that ends in murder, invoking the unwritten law as a defence, took place in 1926 in Canterbury. The case involves two wealthy married men, who have both attended Eton and Cambridge, and the wife of one of them. The background. The participants of this tragedy are John Derham, a well-known international hockey player, 
Derham is married but estranged from his wife. They live apart. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Alfonso Smith inherited half a million dollars from his Canadian grandfathers. He and his wife live at Hearn Bay, and it is here that they make the acquaintance of the dashing sports figure Mr. John Derham, sometime in December 1925. The Smiths have three children. An intimacy develops between Mr. Derham and Mrs. Smith, which Mr. Smith becomes aware of. Smith's jealousy knows no bounds, and his anger is extreme towards Derham of having ruined his wife and ruined their marriage. In August 1926, Mrs. Smith is staying with her sister, Miss Wright, at the Villa Stella Maurice on the Kent coast in the town of Whitstable. The upset from Smith has over the eight months of his wife's relationship with Derham become an obsession, although, strangely, it is reported that he is on good terms with his wife. A steady stream of volatile letters between Mr. Smith and Mr. Derham show the frantic nature of Smith's jealousy. A trap is laid by Smith with a telegram forged as his wife, requesting Derham to visit her at the Villa Stella Maurice. Smith has conveniently borrowed a revolver from a friend in the military. Not unexpectedly, the scene is set for murder. From the Daily Herald on the 4th of September 1926, one of us had to go, the amazing court story of shot sportsman, triangle of tragedy. Ex-guards officer for trial on murder charge. Intensely dramatic evidence was given at Canterbury yesterday when Alfonso Francis Austin Smith, aged 37, formerly an officer in the 4th Dragoon Guards, who inherited a fortune of nearly $2 million dollars from his grandfathers, the late Hugh Ryan and the late Sir Frank Smith, two Canadian magnates, was committed for trial at Maidstone Assizes, charged with the murder of John Adam Tyler Derham at Stella Maurice, Tankerton, Whitstable, on August the 12th. Mr Derham was a well-known international hockey player and the grandson of the late Brigadier General Tyler, V.C. Both Derham and Smith attended Eton and Cambridge. Mr. Sefton Cohen, for the prosecution, said that about last Christmas, when Smith and his wife were living in a flat at Hearn Bay, Derham, a married man living apart from his wife, came to the house and became acquainted with them. Early in July, Smith became acutely jealous of his association with his wife, and on August the 9th, Smith arrived at Stella Maurice, where Mrs. Smith was staying with her sister. Miss Wright stated that Smith appeared to be on good terms with his wife, and on the evening of the 12th, Miss Wright Passing the drawing room saw Derham, Smith, and his wife, and the door was shut as she passed, but she heard the voices of all three loudly. Supper together. Derham subsequently came into the kitchen, and Smith, his wife, and Derham left the house together. After they left, Miss Wright saw that the drawing room was in disorder and that a table was lying with a leg broken. The three went to the Marine Hotel and had supper and a bottle of champagne, and shortly before eleven returned to Stella Maurice. Mrs. Smith and her sister prepared a bed in the spare room for Derham, and the sister overheard Smith say, I won't have this other lover of yours sleeping in this house. Twenty minutes later, Miss Wright, from her bedroom, heard a bang. Running down, she saw Smith lying on the floor, and Durham 
sitting across him, striking him. A builder living in Whitstable saw through the window two men and a woman standing in the room. The man nearest the woman made a sudden dash for the other man. There was a crash of glass, and the man in the corner was pushed against the window and appeared to be pulled to the floor. The man who made the rush struck at something on the floor. He got up and appeared to be pressing something to his stomach. A little later, Durham was found in front of the house. Three men, one of whom was the builder, went into the house. Smith was on the floor with wounds on his head. He said, you three will make a good jury, and I know you will give an honest verdict. I loved my wife dearly. She invited him here. One of us had to go. Police must untangle the events of this dramatic and confusing scene. The four at the scene are Miss Wright, who is Mrs. Smith's sister, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and Mr. John Derham. Although Mr. Derham was seen on top of Mr. Smith, hitting him with a pistol, it is actually Derham who is shot by Smith, eventually dying from his wounds. Mr. Smith, also hurt in the affray, easily recovers. There is no question as to who killed Derham, and Smith is arrested. An inquest is held to formally establish the facts of the case, and who was responsible. From the Sheffield Independent on the 4th of September, 1926. Charged with the murder of a wife's friend, despicable intrigue, revolver shots at Villa, rich man sent for trial. Strong passages in letters written by a wealthy man to one whom he accused of an intrigue with his wife were quoted at Canterbury Police Court yesterday when Alfonso Francis Austin Smith, 37, was charged with the murder of John Adam Tyler Durham on the 12th of August by shooting him at Stella Maurice, a house in St Anne's Road, Tankerton, in Winstable. Both Smith and Derham went to Eton and Cambridge, and both served with distinction in the war. Durham, who was a well-known international hockey player, lived at Claver House near Hearn Bay, and was a grandson of the late Brigadier General Tyler, V.C., Smith is the grandson of the late Sir Hugh Ryan and the late Sir Frank Smith, two prominent Canadian magnates from whom he inherited nearly half a million dollars. Durham died in a nursing home from a wound in the abdomen, and a letter Smith handed to the police said that Durham had come between him and his wife. Mr Sefton Cohen prosecuted on behalf of the Director of Public Prosecution and Mr F. Gills Kimber of London represented the accused. Acutely jealous. Mr Cohen said that shortly before midnight on the 12th of August, Durham was found on the pavement outside the house, Stella Maurice, suffering from a bullet wound in the abdomen. He died the following day. The accused, Alfonso Smith, was arrested and charged with murder. The accused was a married, independent man living with his wife and children. Last Christmas, he and his wife were living in a small flat at Hearn Bay, and there Derham be became acquainted with them. Derham was a married man living apart from his wife. He was 40 years of age and also, evidently, of independent means. In the early part of July, accused appeared to have become acutely jealous of Durham's association with his wife. On the 14th of July, he went to Durham's address at Cricklewood Hill, London, and in Mr Durham's absence took two photographs of his Smith's wife that he found there. 
On the following day, the accused went to Claverhouse. Miss Lily Wright, sister of Mrs. Smith, went to Stella Maurice and, and was there at the house on the day of the tragedy. As the tension of the crime to come builds, Mrs. Smith and her sister find a revolver stashed away in the villa. To put it out of commission, Mrs. Smith holds the revolver under running water for several minutes. The water has no impact at all on the revolver's functionality. From the Sheffield Independent on the 4th of September 1926, Revolver Incident On the 10th of August, a revolver was found in a coal scuttle at Stella Maurice and was hidden in a glove box. Later, it was found in the kitchen and the accused wife, Mrs. Smith, held it under a running tap, presumably, said Mr. Cohen, to put it out of action. Of course, it, ha it had no such effect. The accused, Alfonso Smith, came on the scene and took possession of it. After the accused, his wife and Derham had had their supper together at a hotel, returning to the house at about 11 p.m., the sister overheard the accused say, I won't have the other lover of yours sleeping in this house. Soon afterwards, Miss Wright heard sounds of quarrelling, and afterwards the bang of a gun. She went downstairs and saw the accused lying on the floor, with Durham across him, striking him on the head and shoulders with something. Lily Wright, a pretty girl of sixteen, said she had stayed several minutes with Smith and her sister, and she had often seen the prisoner under the influence of drink. After describing how, after hearing a shot, she and her sister were trying to pull Derham away from Smith, who was lying on the drawing-room floor, witness said that she saw Derham open the door and stagger into the street. He was holding a revolver to his stomach at the time. Witness followed him out, and she saw him fall down. She hid the revolver in the garden and later gave it to Inspector Rivers. Witness said that she did not notice what the accused did when she and her sister pulled Derham off him. Mr. Sefton Cohen read the letter Smith handed to the police. It was as follows. My dear, dear girl, this problem can only be solved in one way the removal of your lover, Derham, or myself. With the characteristic cowardice which that individual has shown throughout your mean and sordid intrigue, he removed himself from his rooms, fearing, I presume, the consequence of a visit from me. Whether he imagines he would have a comfortable second home in my house you live in, and a mistress gratis on my money, settled on you, or whether he thought that I, being out of the way, you would be an easy victim, I know not. But this I do know, that his pursuit of you, a young married woman with three children, babies, and a little money, knowing in full that marriage, he being already married, was impossible, was and is a despicable and damnable thing. Nor are you much less to blame with your constant lies and the enlistment of your reputable friends to cover up your affairs. One aspect that arises within the case is that Smith is heavily in debt. Durham is well off both from family and his international sports career. The implication is that one reason his wife has become and begun relations with Derham, is for money. The letters from Smith continue, from the Sheffield Independent on the 4th of September, 1926. Too mean and disgusting. I was hard up, and you had his car. A life for a Morris Cowley, in your opinion, is a fair exchange. Your honour seems to have counted for nothing. I helped you in every way, and you asked the man with you to my home 
rode in his car and no doubt let Durham pay for your drink. The whole thing is too mean and too disgusting for me. I cannot, while I live, and cannot go on supporting this great enemy of mind and heart. May God forgive me for what I am about to do, and may God forgive you the cause of it all. As for your men, you will always have this between you, and if you can go on after it, there are no sentences in the language which could be construed to express what you both are. My will is at Wilkinson's. You have now ten thousand pounds of mine, and after this five thousand pounds and other monies will be yours and the children's. I have no more to say. My heart is broken, and there is nothing in life for me. If you hold anything sacred in this world or in the next, look after the children. They and you, God help me, are my only regret. I still love you too much. Your husband, Frank. The letter read aloud at the inquest that had been written by the prisoner Smith was open for much interpretation. One meaning was that Smith was planning to kill Derham, and that is the take the prosecution took. The other possible meaning, as proposed by the defence, was that he intended to kill himself. With two possible interpretations, intense scrutiny was given to the build-up of the crime. One of the main sticking points was the telegram that was sent by Smith feigning to be his wife, to Durham, begging him to visit her at Villa Stella Maurice. From the Sheffield Independent on the 4th of September 1926, come down tonight. Counsel added that a telegram in the handwriting of the accused was handed in Whitstable Post Office early on the day of the tragedy and addressed to Durham and signed Kathleen. It stated, Will you come down for a few hours tonight? Most urgent. Wire GPO. Whitstable, not house. Come house if not at station. Dr. Whitney said Smith's injuries were not very serious. Smith was suffering from the effects of drink. In the witness's opinion, the shot was not fired from close range. Friendly terms. Cross-examined, Miss White, the sister of Mrs. Smith, said the two standing together at the window were Mrs. Smith and the dead man. The first that she saw of the revolver was when Derham stood up with it in his hand. Derham was not pulled off Smith, but got up himself. Mary Wyatt, who was engaged by Mrs. Smith as the children's nurse, said Mrs. Smith and Derham appeared on friendly terms, and he called her Kathleen. On one occasion, Smith told her he loved his wife dearly, and that Derham had stolen her from him, and he was going to smash everything belonging to Derham. He started to pull the pictures down and smash them. He said, added the children's nurse, that he would kill both Derham and his wife, and would not mind if he was arrested. Borrowed Revolver On Monday the 9th of August, the accused Alfonso Smith asked his friend David Balfour to lend him a revolver. Witness lent him the revolver produced because accused said he was going to Ireland that night and wanted it for self-protection. He also borrowed six cartridges like those produced. More letters are produced by the prosecution showing the passionate jealousy and hatred Smith evinced for Derham. From the Sheffield Independent, the 4th of September 1926, the guise of friendship. Mr. Cohen read out these letters, which Smith accused Derham of stealing his wife. In one dated July, he wrote, For months, under the guise of friendship, you have sought 
to seduce my wife and wreck my home. You have been intriguing to bring about a separation. On the 18th of July, he wrote, You have stolen my wife after eating bread. Don't leave blotting paper about saying very much in love, Jack. Writing from the Grosvenor Hotel, Smith again accused Derham of seducing his wife and told him not to think that he would get off lightly in the divorce court. He said, You have taken my wife, but I have taken something of yours. Find it, you dirty, white-livered fool. You lied to me, and now, by God, you will have to suffer. You have ruined not only a sweet girl, but the woman I love, and not whom you love. If you really loved her, you could not have done this. Inspector Rivers from Whitstable gave evidence to the effect that he went to Stella Murray's with police officers on the night of the 12th of August. Smith was certainly under the influence of liquor. When witness charged him with the attempted murder, he said, I am not guilty, and subsequently, when charged with murder after the death of Derham, he made a similar reply. Alleged Statement Sergeant Quested of Whitstable said the accused told him, I intended to shoot myself, but in the struggle for the revolver it went off and shot Derham. After a retirement by the magistrate, Mr. Charles Harvey said that there was no alternative except to commit the accused to the Kent Assizes on the murder charge. The accused when asked if, if he had anything to say why he should not be committed, replied, Nothing, except that I am not guilty. Smith was then committed to the next Kent Assizes. Alfonso Smith, although in debt, pooled enough money to buy the very best in legal defence. This included the ailing Sir Edward Marshall Hall. The defence cleverly used the letters which could be read either as a threat of murder or as letters implying a suicide attempt to come. The gun accidentally went off, shooting Mr. Derham in the struggle to gain control of it, is one of the defence tacks. The trial. The courtroom was packed to watch the unfolding drama of an upper-class murder case involving the killing of a well-known international sports figure. From the Western Mail, the 26th of November, 1926. No unwritten law. Jealousy discussed in murder trial. Triangle of two old Etonians and a woman. In this country, there is no unwritten law. Our law does not accept that a man either has a good or a bad reason being jealous of another man. This was stated by Mr. Roland Oliver K.C., prosecuting on Thursday in what is known as the Stella Morris murder trial. Alfonso Francis Austin Smith, aged 37, educated at Beaumont, Eton and Cambridge, was charged with murdering John Adam Durham, also of Eton and Cambridge, at a house called Stella Maurice at Whitstable on August the 12th. There was a secondary charge against Smith of being in possession of a Webley service revolver and four rounds of ammunition with intent to endanger life. In a packed courtroom court, Mr Oliver declared that if Smith were found guilty, the jury would have no doubt that the motive was jealousy, whether just or unjust did not matter. Mrs. Smith, who had recently recovered from a severe illness, cannot, of course, be called by the prosecution to give evidence, and she was not present when the trial opened. There was an array of well-known counsel. Sir Edward Marshall Hall defended Smith. Mr. Oliver plunged at once into the facts of the case in opening for the Crown. 
At about 11.30 on August 12th last, a man named John Adam Derham was shot through the body in a house called Stella Maris with a revolver. It is your grave task to inquire whether the man in the dock, Alfonso Francis Austin Smith, is guilty of his murder. Unsigned separation deed. Outlining the history of the case, counsel went on to say how Smith had been living with his wife at various addresses at Hearn Bay up to May. The evidence was that they got on fairly well but quarrelled sometimes. Counsel took the story up to June when he said the differences between Smith and his wife became acute. Toward the end of June, the prisoner left his home, went right away and never returned to his wife again until August the 9th, which was a day or two prior to the tragedy. Derham continued to see the prisoner's wife while Smith was away, and during this time Mrs. Smith went to her solicitors and asked them to prepare a deed of separation, which was done. That document was found amongst the prisoner's possessions when he was arrested, but it had not been signed. Revolver in court. The next phase of counsel's opening took the scene to the little Villa Stella Maurice at Whitstable, into which Mrs. Smith moved in August with her three young children and her sister, Lily White, aged 16. Just about this time, Smith possessed himself of a revolver which he borrowed from a friend with the excuse that he was going to Ireland and wanted it for his protection. Then on August the 9th, Alfonso Smith arrived at the bungalow and stayed that night with his wife. They were apparently on amicable terms. On August the 10th, Mrs. Smith made some statement to her sister and together they searched the house and found a revolver Smith had left. Decoy Telegram At 2pm on August the 12th, Smith sent a telegram to which he drew the jury's most earnest attention because it was a factor of inestimable importance in this case. It was addressed to John Derham. The telegram was, Will you come down for a few hours tonight to me? Urgent. Wire train. Not house. Most urgent. Come to house if I am not at the station. Kathleen. Why did Smith send that telegram? He asked the jury to decide whether it was not a trap to get Derham to come. You stole my wife. Counsel then read various letters written by the prisoner to Durham. One read, Durham, you have endeavoured to or have accomplished to steal my wife. The answer is mine and I will answer. Durham, you once remarked to me that all was fair in love and war, so blame only yourself for what has happened. You stole my wife after eating my bread. I retaliate in other ways. Another letter dated July 16th read, You swine, I only wish you had the courage to meet me. You have seduced my wife, and for that you think that you will get off easily in the divorce court. Counsel described how on the night of the tragedy Mrs. Smith went to bed leaving her husband and Derham together. She heard a shot and ran downstairs into the drawing room. There on the floor on his back was her husband and over him striking his face with something obviously a revolver, was Derham. I ask you to say, said counsel, that Smith had shot Derham, and he had then sprung upon him to get the revolver away and was striking him on the head. Derham was taken to the hospital and within 24 hours was dead. The filled courtrooms eagerly followed the salacious story from the upper classes unfold before them. The use of what was normally a French line of defence of unwritten law 
was a bold move by the defence. Astonishingly, it worked. As Sir Hall dramatically read letters from Smith, in which he begs his wife to return to him, one juror burst into tears. Sir Hall continues asking that the jury throw a life belt to Smith that his wife had refused him. This the jury does by acquitting him, much to the indignation of Judge Avery. From the Sheffield Daily Telegraph, 29th of November, 1926, Stella Murray's drama, Smith acquitted on capital charge, scenes in court, judge and the unwritten law. After a trial lasting for three days, Alfonso Francis Austin Smith was at the Kent Assizes at Mainston on Saturday found not guilty of the murder of John Adam Tyler Durham, a well-known international hockey player at a house called Stella Murris at Winstable. Smith pleaded guilty to a charge of possessing firearms with intent to endanger life, and Mr Justice Avery, passing a sentence of 12 months hard labour, remarking, The jury have taken upon your trial the most lenient view that was possible of this case. The judge summed up for an hour and 35 minutes, and the jury were absent for two hours and ten minutes, considering their verdict. When the jury returned their verdict, there was an immediate outburst of hand-clapping and cheering from all over the court, which was promptly suppressed by the police on duty. Smith heard his sentence without saying a word, and after glaring fiercely at the judge, walked once from the docks to the cells. To the end of the trial, Smith showed no sign of the suspense through which he had passed. Mrs. Smith, who was not in court when the verdict was announced, stated on hearing it, Oh, that's splendid. I had a wonderful letter from my husband this morning. This, of course, will mean that we shall come together again. Mrs. Derham stated afterwards, I am very glad that another life has not been lost by this terrible business. Nothing but approval of the verdict could be heard in the conversations of the crowd assembled outside the court. The Sheffield Daily Tra Telegraph is informed authoritatively that it is almost certain that no appeal will be made against the sentence. The defence contended that the telegram was not a trap, that Smith deliberately contemplated suicide, and that the fatal shot was fired during a struggle between him and Derham for the possession of the revolver with which Smith contemplated killing himself. A remarkable case of the unwritten law, successfully used as a defence in an English court, and also a fine example of the brilliance of Sir Edward Marshall Hall. Some additional features of the case. The appearance of the revolver during the incident was vague. It was stated that a game of cards had been suggested and that Smith had produced the gun at its onset. The appearance of the gun was then misinterpreted as a threat and a struggle ensued for the gun resulting in the accidental shooting of Derham. Mr Justice Avery was very angry at the acquittal and threw the full weight of the law on Smith at the sentencing regarding the possession of a firearm to commit bodily harm, with twelve months hard labour. Smith himself was in tremendous debt, despite the hefty inheritance he had been given. He died in 1944, impoverished. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, The Unwritten Law. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. 
Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.